the words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Philippians in the third chapter and reading verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11 in the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let me give you a reminder of the context by beginning to read at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> now those of us who meet here regularly will remember that we've been looking at this great statement made here by the Apostle, indeed in the entire chapter, of the very essence of the Christian faith. He begins by telling these men to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. In other words, he tells them there that he has often spoken of these things to them before, and yet he feels it necessary to write about them once more. Why does he do so? Well, there is his first reason. For you, he says, it is safe. He means by that that the most important thing for anybody to know in this world is what is the Christian gospel. Because that's the thing with which he's dealing. And he says there's nothing more important than this. It, it is the only way to be safe. He says there is no salvation in any other. There is no other message that can deliver men in a world like this. So he says, though I've written about these things before, and though I spoke about them when I was with you, I come back and I say them all again, because I'm troubled about you. Why was he troubled? Well, he was troubled because of certain false teachers who'd gone round the churches and muddled them and said, uh, this is Christianity, not what that man Paul said, and here they were in a state of utter confusion. So in order to bring them back again to the true message of Christianity, he gives us this wonderful statement of what it really means to be a Christian. A Christian, he says, is a man who worships God in the spirit, who rejoices in Christ Jesus and who has no confidence in the flesh. That's what makes a man a Christian. And then he goes on to say, these other wonderful things about this Christian message and this Christian position. Well, now, I'm calling attention to it for the very selfsame reason that led the great apostle to do so. If ever we needed to be made safe, it is surely at a time like this. When everything is uncertain, everything is insecure. All the things on which men had pinned their faith so long have been shaken, things which we thought were going to last forever, disappearing. Our empire in which the sun never sets, where is it? All these things that seem to be so durable in this century, we have seen them shaken. And the whole world is in confusion tonight, doesn't know what to do nor where to turn. With all the terrible possibilities that are there with these instruments of war and destruction being piled up, what is there in the whole world tonight that is quite so important as just this one matter? What is this message that offers to make us safe for time and for eternity? Now, the great question, of course, is this. With this Bible open before us, with this message here offering this to us, 
Why is it that men and women don't believe it? And it seems to me that the apostle deals with that question also in his own masterly manner. You see, he says that for himself, having seen this, he counts everything else but loss. Indeed, he goes further. He says, having seen this, I count everything else but dung, manure, refuge. Very well, then it doesn't it come to this. That men and women who don't believe this message and who are not Christian are in that position simply because they've never seen it. They don't know what Christianity is. That's the trouble. They've never realized what he calls here the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's the thing we need to know. And thank God the apostle tells us something about it. Now he makes that statement here in verse 8 that he counts all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom he says I have already suffered the loss of all things but I count them as but dung that I may win Christ. Now what's the content then of this excellent knowledge? Last Sunday night we spent our time in expanding the ninth verse where he says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, through faith. And we saw that he meant this. He says, The thing that I want is this. I want to be found in Christ. What he means is that when the hurricane comes, when the end of the world arrives, and we're all in the judgment of God, that he shall be found hidden in Christ. You see, it's because of this kind of statement that Augustus Toplady was inspired to write his famous hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Now, we were dealing there last Sunday night with the first part, the guilt. Here's a man, you see, who's been awakened to the fact that he's a guilty sinner. That all his morality and all his righteousness and all his religion and all his good works and the fact that he was a Jew, one of God's chosen people, was of no value to him. He'd thought this was of great value at one time, but he says in verse 7, the things which were gained for me, them I counted loss for Christ. He's seen that he's a guilty sinner like everybody else. And there is God and his judgment. What can he do? He wants to hide himself somewhere. He says, thank God, the possibility is there. I want to be found in Christ. Covered by his righteousness. Clothed with his perfection. And he says, I found it in Christ. That's the message of Christianity. That we are saved from the wrath of God and the judgment by believing and realizing that the Son of God has taken our sins upon him and has borne our punishment, and that his perfect life of righteousness is put upon us, so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees the righteousness of Christ. We are in Christ. We are joined to him. And we share in all his great and glorious work, crucified with Christ, we've died with Christ, we've been buried, we've been risen, and so on, raised again. Now that is what he tells us in verse 9. And that, of course, in itself is wonderful. Do you put the whole world against that? What's the value of a peaceful conscience? Who can assess it? What has the world and all its treasures got to offer tonight? that is of comparable value to peace of conscience. To know that your sins are forgiven. To be able to put your head down on the pillow knowing that if you should die during the night, it's all right. You're going to go on to be with Christ, which is far better. Not to be afraid of death. Not to be afraid of the judgment of God. Not to be afraid of the end of the world. It's a wonderful thing, then. It's not surprising that he says he counts all things but lost when he puts it before this. What else is of value? All you are won't help you when you're dying. Your wealth won't help you. Your relatives can't help you. The whole world and its knowledge can't help you. Nobody can help you there. You're alone, a naked soul, in the presence of your maker and your judge. And there's nothing and no one that can help you. But then this blessed knowledge 
that you can hide in Christ and you're safe. It's not surprising, I say, that he counts everything else but loss when put by the side of this. But you see, he's not content. He doesn't stop at it. He goes on. He says that's only the beginning of it. He goes on now that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Listen, says this man. I've been negative so far. All I've told you about the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus up to this point is negative. It is that you're saved from judgment, from hell, from eternal punishment. But he says, that's negative, that's only the beginning. Listen, oh, there's much more that I have to put before you. And here he expounds it in this glorious statement that we are privileged to look at together this evening. Now, my friends, this is the thing that really explains why to this great man, this mighty apostle, everything else is loss and dung? It's when you begin to look at these things, everything else pales utterly into insignificance. Now, this is what I want to hold before you. This is essential Christianity. Men and women, I say, are not Christians because they don't know what it is. Their idea of Christianity is that you pull a long face, you stop doing everything you like doing and try to do things you hate, and that it's a miserable, wretched life, that you forsake all joys and all happiness and all pleasure, and you shut yourself down to this narrow, cramped, confined little life. That's their view of Christianity. Oh, what a tragedy it is. There are others who seem to think that, tra- that Christianity is nothing but a kind of negative protest against everything. Look at your Christians, they say, your ministers and others. There they are in the papers always. They're protesting against war, against bombs, against drink, against this, that, and always a negative protest. Oh, what a miserable life. They say, we don't want it. Well, there's a sense in which I don't blame them. For if that is Christianity, I most certainly would not be preaching it. But that isn't Christianity. It's almost the opposite of Christianity. What's Christianity? Well, this is Christianity. If you want to know what Christianity is, go and read the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Here it is here again. This man's thrilling. This man's excited. This man says, look here, I know something about values, he says. I was trained as a Pharisee. I've been living an intellectual life. I've read the philosophers. He was a free free man of the Roman Empire. He'd enjoyed unusual and exceptional privileges. You know, says Paul, all that to me has become a manure heap since I've seen this. What is this? Now this, I say, is essential Christianity. Christianity is something that fills a man with joy, that fills a man with this thrilling understanding of this wonderful thing. Now then, that's the thing that I'm privileged to hold before you this very night. Christianity doesn't just mean that you're forgiven and that you don't go to hell and that you hope to go to heaven. That's only the beginning of it. Christianity has astounding things to offer us in this life and in this world. Thrilling things, moving things. Go back, I say again, and read about those people in the book of the Acts of the Apostles and this is what you'll find. You will find that they were persecuted. You will find that the Roman authorities came to them and said, if you don't stop saying that this Jesus of yours is Lord and begin to say that Caesar is Lord, we'll put you to death. We'll throw you to the lions in the arena. Stop saying this, this. Deny your Christ and say that Caesar is Lord. If you don't, you're going to death. But they didn't listen. They went willingly and gladly and they were thrown to the lions in the arena And you know what they were saying as that happened to them? This is what they were saying, we are told. They were thanking God that at last they'd been accounted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. They gloried in it. They died triumphantly. They said, put us to death if you like. All you're doing is you're ushering us into the presence of our Lord, the one whom we refuse to deny. And this, of course, has been the story of the martyrs throughout the running centuries. Have you read of the martyrs of Smithfield in the 16th century? Have you read of the martyrs in the 17th century, the Covenanters in Scotland and many of the Puritans in this country? Have you read about these men? They'd gladly face death 
Why? Well, because of this, this thing which they've got. What is this? Well, my friends, this is the thing, you see, that's been made possible by what happened on the first Whit Sunday in Jerusalem. This is Whit Sunday. What's Whit Sunday? What's the meaning of Whit Sunday? Why do we talk about Whit Sunday? Why does the church celebrate Whit Sunday? What's it all about? Well, you see, this is the anniversary of that astounding thing that happened there in Jerusalem on that first Whit Sunday. What was it? Well, what you're told is this. Here are a number of Christian people, these disciples and 120 others. They were in rather a sad and a miserable state. You can read the pages of the four Gospels, and there you'll read about them blundering, asking their foolish questions, showing lack of understanding, appearing to be utterly stupid men. Look at a man like Peter, always boasted of himself as a kind of daredevil, ready to volunteer anywhere, meet anything. And yet you remember that when he was challenged in that courtroom, when he'd gone to listen to the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, he denied him with oaths and cursing. Why? Because he was afraid of death, wanting to save his skin, miserable coward. But look at him on this day of Pentecost. He stands up and he preaches to a great crowd of Jews, the very people who'd cried about Christ away with him, crucify him. And he preaches to them. And he convicts them of sin. He tells them what they did without fear. He didn't stop to think, will they pull me to pieces if I do this? Will these Jews put me to death? He never thought of it for a moment. He didn't mind what happened. He's a transformed man. He's filled with vigor, with power, with assurance, with fearlessness. What is it? Oh, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that do? That's the very thing we are dealing with in these verses. What the Holy Spirit does is to enable a man to see and to know the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one explanation of why the Apostle Paul writes like this. He'd been filled with the Spirit. He'd met him, you remember, on the road to Damascus. But that more or less shocked him and stunned him. He didn't quite know where he was. He was blind for three days. Then Ananias went to him and baptized him. And he was baptized with the Holy Ghost also. And from there on, this is how he writes. Now, this is Christianity. Christianity is not just vaguely believing in Christ hoping that your sins are forgiven, hoping that ultimately you'll get to heaven. That's not real Christianity. This is the thing. Very well then, my friends, let us look at these things together. Let us see how these men were once they received this mighty blessing. It's the contrast between the disciples before Pentecost and the disciples after Pentecost. Once they pass through Pentecost, they're thrilling with joy. They're ready to meet life. They're ready to meet death. Nothing can stop them. Here they are. And you read that most exhilarating book, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, and you see that they're quite irrepressible. And they're ready to face all things, come what may. And here I say we are told the secret of it all. Listen to me, says Paul. What I can't understand, he says, is how any of you were ever ready to listen to those false teachers. What amazes me, he says, is that anybody's thinking in terms of being a Jew, or being circumcised on the eighth day, doing this, that, or the other. Oh, says Paul, if only you had this excellency of this knowledge of Christ Jesus, you'd never look at it again. Listen to me, he says, I'll tell you what this has brought me. And so he goes on, this is it, to know Christ, that I may know him. What an astonishing statement for the man to make. It means to come to know him by experience. It must mean that. The apostle is not merely saying here that he wants to know things about the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew those already. As I have reminded you, he met him on the road to Damascus. He knew all the teaching concerning him. He'd been told it all. But that isn't what he wants. He says, what I'm after is this, I want to win Christ. I want to know him. And it means, I say, to know him by experience. Did you realize, my friend, that this is a part of Christianity? It doesn't just mean that you know things about the Lord Jesus Christ, that you believe certain things about him. It means that you know him himself. That you have a living, vital, experimental 
knowledge of him. That's the thing the apostle is speaking about. But I'm afraid that so many of us have never realized this. We say, what's to be a Christian? Well, to be a Christian is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for my sins, that I'm therefore forgiven and that I go to heaven. And that's all. Oh, but that's the merest beginning. That's the first principles of the gospel of Christ. This is the astounding thing. This is the thing that makes Paul feel that everything else is done and lost. He says, I can know him. I have known him, but I want to know him more. That's what he's after. To have a deeper, more intimate, more personal knowledge of him. What does he mean by this personal and experimental knowledge? Well, I think perhaps this is best explained by uh, those statements that I read to you at the beginning in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. Our Lord there said, you remember, I shall not leave you comfortless, which might very well be translated, I shall not leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone, he says. I'm going, but I'm going to send another comforter to you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. He says the world can't receive him because it doesn't know him. The world doesn't know what you mean when you talk about the Holy Spirit. The world is only interested in sense, in matter, in things that can be felt and touched and handled. You talk about Holy Spirit, the world says, what are you talking about? It doesn't know, so it doesn't receive him. But you, he says, do know. You remember how later on he said this to them, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. Now then, that's the explanation of this. It's an astounding thing, this. But this is the Lord's own teaching. There he was standing in the flesh. With the disciples looking at him. They could speak to him. They could ask questions. They could take all their difficulties to him. Oh, what a wonderful thing, says somebody. Oh, that I was alive at that time. Oh, that I'd been there then. That's the thing I'd like, to be able to look into his face, to be able to put my questions to him. Haven't we all sometimes felt that we'd give the whole world if we could but do that? But you know, it's quite wrong. Our Lord said, it's a good thing for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. And as he expounded there in John 14, it means this. He says, I'm going away and you won't see me with the naked eye, but I shall come unto you. And I shall dwell in you. And I will manifest myself to you. And my Father and I shall take up our abode in you. That's what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit comes, he says. And that is the explanation of what we are looking at here. The Lord Jesus Christ is more real to the Christian than he ever was to the disciples in the days of his flesh. The apostle Peter, who had been with him for three years, knew him after Pentecost in a way that he'd never known him before. As I've already reminded you, at the end of the three years, Peter could still deny him. And that was because he really didn't know him properly. He'd made his statement at Caesarea Philippi, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, but then he's muddled in a few moments about his death upon the cross. That's not real knowledge. Oh, no, no, it's only after Pentecost that Peter really gets to know him. Christ enters into Peter. Christ lives in Peter. Christ manifests himself to Peter. He knows him after Pentecost, though he doesn't see him with the naked eye in a way that he'd never known him before. That's the thing to which the Apostle Paul is referring here that I may know him. He means by this, that I may be conscious of his presence, that wherever I am, I know he is with me. When I sit alone in my room, he's there. I feel he's near. There I can have communion with him and fellowship with him. That's what John means, he says. I write these things unto you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. Now what does fellowship mean? It means this. You don't have fellowship with a person unless you're in the presence of that person. And you can be in the presence of a person and not have fellowship. It means that there's a sympathy, there's an understanding, you talk to one another, you share thoughts with one another, and you say things to one another. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
This is Christianity. A Christian is not just a man who is forgiven and who is then allowed to walk through this world absolutely alone. No, no. I will come unto you. I will manifest myself unto you. I will take up my abode in you. Fellowship with the Father. Enjoying his love. And hearing him telling you that he loves you. And asking for your love in return. That's what's meant by knowing him. Our hymn, one of our hymns puts it so well. Listen to this. I see thee not. I hear thee not. Yet art thou oft with me. And earth hath ne'er so dear a spot. As where I meet with thee. Have you met him, my friends? Can you appropriate those words? I see thee not, I hear thee not. Yet art thou oft with me, and earth hath ne'er so dear a spot as where I meet with thee. This was the thing that was thrilling the Apostle Paul. This is the thing that makes the hymn writer cry out and say, O love divine, how sweet thou art! When shall I find my willing heart? All taken up with thee. That's what Paul is saying. I thank you, he says, for the knowledge I've got, but I want more. I want to know him yet more and more and more. O oh, love divine, how sweet thou art. When shall I find my willing heart? All taken up with thee. I thirst, I faint, I die to prove the greatness of redeeming love, the love of Christ to me. That's the thing the apostle is speaking about that I may know him. And he did know him. And it was because he knew him he wanted to know him, as I say, more and more and more. You see, that's why he says that everything else is loss and everything else is dung. We are all interested in knowing great people, aren't we? The world is full of that sort of ambition. How can I get an introduction to so-and-so? We all like to boast we've spoken to a great man, shaken hands with him. What wouldn't people give to have an entrance into Buckingham Palace and to be able to claim that they're intimates of the Queen? Oh, how we prize these things. But you know what it means to be a Christian? It means that you know him, the Son of God. You really know him. You know what it is to speak to him. You know what it is to listen to him. You know what it is to be in his presence. You know what it is for him to tell you that he loves you, that he loved you and gave himself for you, that he's interested in you personally. That's what he's talking about. The Son of God, the Lord of glory. It's possible in this world and in this life to know him, to have him as a companion, to feel as you walk down the rusty, dusty roads of life that he's with you, that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and that he keeps his word, and that he's ever there, so that when you're in a crisis and in trouble, you say, I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh, and you know he's answering. That I might know him. You see, the world knows nothing about this, that's why it doesn't believe in him. It's outside the church tonight because it doesn't know what true Christianity is. It's not safe. It's been muddled as these people were. Listen, says Paul, this is the thing. Nothing else matters but this, to know him and to enjoy this companionship and this fellowship. But you notice that he didn't stop there. That I might know him, he says, and the power of his resurrection. What does this mean? This is another wonderful aspect of this Christian life, what's offered us here in this gospel, the power of his resurrection. What a power. That means a power that's stronger than death, a power that's stronger than the grave, a power that's stronger than Hades. Power of his resurrection. He died in weakness. He was crucified and he died and they took down his body and they buried it in that grave. But we are told that death couldn't hold him. He burst asunder the bands of death. He rose triumphant over the grave. The resurrection, what is it? It's the power of God. Nothing less. 
There is no other power in the universe that is stronger than death in the grave save the power of God himself. And what the apostle says here that he longs to know more and more is the power of his resurrection. This is not a reference to his future resurrection in the body. He is talking about what he wants while he's still here in this world. And what does this mean? Well, this is an aspect of the Christian life that this great apostle expounds at great length in many of his epistles. You see, it means this. This being in Christ, it means that everything that's happened to him happens to us. A Christian is a man, as I reminded you last Sunday night, who has been crucified with Christ. He's died with Christ. He's been buried with Christ. Yes, but he's risen with Christ. This is the power of the resurrection. It is a living power in the man while he remains in this life and in this world. Let me read to you the Apostle's great statement of it in Romans chapter 6. Likewise, reckon you yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Do you know what that means, my friend? That's Christianity. The Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesians, and this is his prayer for them. I pray, he says, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and placed him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. That's it. And then he prays again for those Ephesians in chapter 3 and in verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. That's the power of the resurrection. What's it got to do with me, says someone? Well, here it is. To be a Christian means that you're in Christ and that you're no longer the man you were left to yourself and your own powers and ingenuity to fight the world and the flesh and the devil. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not a man trying to live a good life and trying to imitate and follow Christ and trying to key himself up to this and ever failing. That's not Christianity. That's morality. That's religion. What is Christianity then? Well, it's this. It's the power that raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, entering into a man, energizing him, filling him with power, filling him with an ability which he never had before. Oh, my dear friend, have you realized this? This is the thing that makes a man say that everything else is lost and done. That a man is renewed, he's born again, he's a new creature. He's got a new life, he's got new power. It's not he himself, it's God, Christ in him. The hope of glory. This is the thing, says Paul, I want to know more and more. What's the value of anything apart from this? What's the value in being a millionaire if I'm a slave to drink? What's the value of having all the knowledge of the universe if I'm an adulterer and a fornicator? If I can't live a clean, a straight, a pure life? What's the value of everything to me if I'm ashamed of myself when I look at myself in the mirror as I go to bed at night? This is the thing a man wants. Power in his life. And it's possible, says Paul, the power of his resurrection. It's in me, I want more of it. What does this power enable a man to do? Well, it enables him to understand this gospel to start with. The apostle has already reminded these Philippians of it in the first chapter, in verses 9 and 10. Listen. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, 
that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Have you got it, my friend? No, no, just to be a good man doesn't make you a Christian. It isn't enough, I say, merely that you believe in Christ and that you believe you are forgiven. Have you this power? Have you this energy? Have you this life? This new life? Are you living a life that is a life of a conqueror in this world? Do you know anything of this increase in knowledge and in understanding? But then he goes on in the 27th verse of this first chapter to put it like this. Only let your conversation be, which means only let your manner of life be in this world as becometh the gospel of Christ. That's, he says, the way in which a Christian lives. His life is a life that becometh the gospel of Christ. It's a wonderful gospel. Yes, but the life of the Christian becomes it. It's like a lady's hat and dress matching one another. There's no clash. It's becoming. They fit together. They go together. That's how you're to live, says Paul. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let your life be an adornment to this wonderful gospel. Oh, this is this power that he's talking about. In the second chapter, he puts it like this. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He doesn't leave us, I say, to struggle hopelessly to follow Christ and to live the Sermon on the Mount. It can't be done. It's impossible. Every man who's tried it has been shattered in defeat. No, no, this is what it offers. The power of his resurrection. The ability really to live this Christian life. It's a power also to overcome sin and temptation. It's a power that will enable us to mortify the deeds of the body. While we are left in this world, the old nature remains in us and it fights against the other. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And that's the problem for every man. How to deal with these things that arise from the flesh. The flesh must be mortified. It must be kept down. There's only one way to do it. If you through the Spirit, says Paul to the Romans, in chapter 8, verse 13, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Here's the only power that can enable a man to do it. It's the power of the resurrection. It comes to me through the Spirit. For the Spirit comes because Christ has conquered death in the grave. He's risen. He's ascended into heaven. And he gives gifts unto men. And the chief gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very well, you're enabled then to overcome sin and to mortify the deeds of the body. But thank God, this is a power that enables us to overcome everything that is set against us in this world. Who knows who can tell what may be coming to us? We've never had it so good. What if it all goes again? What if we go back to the miserable conditions of the 30s and worse? What if we have to meet starvation? What if we have to meet persecution? What if we have to meet trials? What if these bombs are used? What if there's another mad world war? What's going to happen to us? When you're robbed of everything, have nothing left, how do you stand up to it all? There's only one way of standing up to it all. It's in the power of the resurrection. Listen to the apostle putting it to these Philippians in chapter 4. Here he is. They'd sent him a gift. And he says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last you were care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, he says. And remember when he wrote these words, he was a prisoner in Rome. He was chained to a soldier on each side. He'd heard rumors that Nero was about to put him to death. Here he is. This is how he writes. Not that I uh, speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ. Which strengtheneth me. Young man, what if you should lose your health? 
Young woman, what if you should lose your looks? Man, what if you should lose your business? What if you should fail in your profession? What if your health should suddenly go? What if your money goes? What if the worst comes to the worst? How do you meet it all? This is the man, you see, who says, I count all things but lust for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Why? Well, because when I have lost everything, he's still with me. Nobody can rob me of that. They can throw me into prison. He's with me. They can maltreat me, persecute me, malign me. He still loves me. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, you know, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I don't care what happens to me. I'm already a sick man. I'm an old man. I'm on the verge of the grave. It's all right. I can do all things. Through Christ which strengtheneth me. The power of his resurrection is in me. And as it raised him even from death and the grave, it will raise me through everything that the world may do to me. Don't you begin to understand now why he says that everything else is lost and done? Don't you see now what he means by the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord? This is Christianity. It's not pie in the sky. It's living here and now and triumphing and being more than conqueror, being able to meet whatever the future holds without any fear whatsoever because the power of his resurrection is in you. It'll sustain you and it'll bring you right through until you land in the glory, in triumph and in perfection. And then I just mentioned this next thing. Strange, doesn't it sound? that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. What's this? What does he mean by that, says someone? Well, this to the apostle was as great as the other things. He's already said to these Philippians in the first chapter in verse 29, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's given to you in the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his name's sake. That's just Paul's way of saying what our Lord himself had said in the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember it in chapter 5? Let me read it to you. Listen to this. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Or again, as Paul puts it in writing to the Romans in chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, the Spirit also beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we shall also be glorified together. That's what he's talking about, my friends. What does this mean? Why does Paul long to know more and more the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, he means this, you see. He says, I want to be so united to him and become so like him that I shall suffer as he did when he was in this world. When the Son of God was in this world, he was a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. He didn't have a good time in this world. He didn't go waltzing through it, a man of sorrow, and acquainted with grief. What I read about him is this, Jesus groaned in spirit. Jesus wept. Why? Well, he wept because of the sin of the world, because of the pain and the grief and the agony. He had seen this world in its perfection as it was made at the beginning. He'd seen it as paradise, but he came down into it 
And he looked into the faces of evil men and evil women. He saw jealousy, merely spite, hatred. He saw the havoc and the shambles that sin had made of life. And he groaned and he grieved. It hurt him. It wounded him. And that is why he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And what the apostle is saying is this. I want to be so like him that I shall feel as he felt about this world of sin. The apostle did feel it. He says in Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Have you heard him writing to the Corinthians in the second epistle in chapter 5? This is how he puts it. This is his experience. He says, If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the hymns. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. What does he mean? Well, what he means, my friend, is this. That he's burdened and he groans because the world is so evil, because it's so sinful. And as he walks about the streets and he sees little children waiting outside public houses because their fathers and mothers are drinking themselves drunk inside, it hurts him. It makes him weep. It makes him groan. As he sees marriage being broken, sanctities being desecrated and spat upon, little children not knowing the love of father and mother, it hurts him. It grieves him. And he says, I wish I felt that more. I'm too much worldly myself. I want to be more like him. I want to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to feel the agony of it all so that I may do something about it and pray that he'll send his spirit to awaken people. That's what he's praying for. Do we know anything about this, my friends? This is Christianity. This is the real thing. Oh, says Paul, this is my ambition. Not to be a great man in the esteem of the world, but to be like Christ. To be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Not that he wants to be miserable. This isn't masochism. What is it then? Oh, it's a desire for that purity. For that knowledge of God, that Christ-likeness, that makes us react inevitably like this. The fellowship of his suffering. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The world didn't understand him. His own family didn't understand him. He was always misunderstood. And you know, the Christian, when he's a true Christian, is exactly the same. In 1 Corinthians 2.15, this man says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Are you so much like Christ, my friend, that your people don't understand you? I mean, your people who are not Christians? Are you a puzzle and a problem and an enigma to them? Are they mystified at the way you live? Are they shocked at the way you regard all the things they regard so dear as lost and down? That's what he wants, the fellowship of his sufferings. Yes, and even the persecution. Did you notice those astonishing words of our Lord? Rejoice, he says, and be exceeding glad. If they persecute you, they're only doing what they did to me. It's a mark that you're my people. And heaven's waiting for you. And glory indescribable is going to be a lot. I want to know this more and more, says Paul. The fellowship of his sufferings. And the last thing I mentioned this evening is being made conformable unto his death. What is that? Well, let me just summarize it. He is not referring to the actual death, of course, of our Lord. He isn't saying that he wants to die. He says, I want to be made conformable to his death, to the likeness of his death. What is that? Well, it just means this. I want to be as ready to die for others and for God as he did, says Paul. That's what I want. He's already said it all in the second chapter, beginning at verse 3. Listen, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He didn't regard it as a prize to be held on to. 
But instead of that, he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I want to be like that, says Paul. I want to be made conformable to his death. He means this. He wants to be completely selfless. He wants to be like Christ. He wants the mind of Christ to be in him. Christ didn't consider himself. He gave himself utterly for us and to do the will of God. He even went to the death of the cross. That's what I want, says Paul. I want to be dead to this miserable, horrible self. This self that is always so ready to be hurt. This self that's always thinking about its own interests and concerned about its reputation. This self that makes life a hell so often. Wondering what people are thinking. Wondering whether I'm better than somebody else. Oh, says Paul, I hate it. It's the thing that makes me so miserable. I used to live in that realm. I was better than everybody else. I want to be utterly rid of it. I want to die to myself, even as he died to himself and made himself of no reputation. And this Christianity is something that can enable us to do that, my friends. You know you can know him so well that you're not interested in yourself. You've heard of George Muller of Bristol, haven't you? That mighty man with his orphanage. George Muller said this in print. He repeated it many times. A day came, he said, in my life when I died completely and utterly to George Muller. Can you think of anything better than that? Than to be rid of horrible self. Unconcerned about your reputation. The bubble reputation, which men are ready to seek, as Shakespeare reminds us, even in the cannon's mouth. To be finished with it. And to be dead to the world and all it has to offer. That's where Paul was. Writing to the Galatians in the last chapter, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I'm finished with it. The world no longer grips him, masters him, controls him, and determines whether he's happy or miserable. He's finished with it. Crucified. It's crucified. He's crucified to it. And that's why he can say, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therein to be content. Being made conformable unto his death, Yes, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. To whom? To God. Even unto death. Even the death of the cross. In other words, Paul's ambition was this, that he should live in this world only and entirely to the glory of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what is there comparable to this? To live only, utterly, altogether unto him. And to do that more and more and more. To be lost to everything else. Thus, you have the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You are more than conqueror, come what may. And you have riches which are indescribable. Because what I read about my Lord is this. That having become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God... Also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Which is what Paul means, you see, by that last phrase. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection from the dead... I'm not going to deal with it, but that's what it means. That if you die to the world and to self as he did, oh, you'll be raised to a glory and you'll be with him there. And you'll spend your eternity in his glorious presence. If by any means doesn't contain the slightest element of doubt. It's his intense desire. That's what I want, says Paul. Not this old world, but that world. And the glory of it all. And to be with him, looking into his face, enjoying him to absolute perfection forever and forever. That, my friends, is real Christianity. That's the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
Wouldn't you like a life like that? Not only to know that your sins are forgiven, but to enjoy his companionship, to feel the power of his life working in you, to become so like him that the world will treat you as it treated him, to be utterly finished with this miserable, petty, selfish, hopeless self. Then to be able to say, only to do thy will, my will shall be. What a deliverance. What has the world got to offer side by side with this? What are all its glittering prizes? What are all its pomp and show? No, no. Fading is the worldling's pleasure. All is boasted, pomp and show, solid joys, and lasting pleasures. None but Zion's children know. Are you in Christ? Here's the test. Are you ready to give up everything for this? Once a man sees this, once a man sees him and knows him, everything else he counts but loss and dung. My dear friend, while there is still time, look at him. The world will soon take all you've got from you. If the bombs are used, you'll have nothing. You can't hold on to that. It's bound to go. Go in for the solid joys and the lasting pleasures and treasures. They are to be found alone in him, the Son of God, who loved you to such an extent that he came into this world and took the form of a servant and even died on the cross on Calvary's hill in order to save you and to make you a partaker of this riches of his grace and to share with you this astounding Knowledge, this unsearchable knowledge, this excellent knowledge concerning himself and how he can prepare you for the glory everlasting. Oh, I say, give yourself no rest nor peace until you've seen him, until you know something about these things. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. He's been sent to do it. He'll convince you, he'll convict you, he'll give you understanding. Go as a pauper, plead, cry, ask him. Keep on until your eyes are open. And once you've had a glimpse of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, there'll be no need to encourage you much. You'll want with Paul more and more of it, that I might know him and all that follows. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.